The surface of the Earth is in a constant state of change. Geologists look at rocks in order to tell stories of how these changes have occurred over time. And a lot of the stories that geologists can pull out of these rocks have dramatically revolutionized the way that we see the planet. For example, the theory of plate tectonics. Today, we take it for granted that when we feel an earthquake, we know it's because we're living on several distinct plates that move and shift and sometimes collide into one another, and we can feel this at the surface of the Earth. But not too long ago, this idea was thought to be preposterous, and it was much more accepted to believe that the Earth was a static, unchanging system. While the concept of continental drift had been introduced by such scientists as Alfred Wegener and Alex Dutois in the early 1900s, the debate remained unsettled for decades. I'm happy you're able to join me. I'm going to take you all to one of my favorite places on the planet. It's a place called Nussbaum Regal. It's in the center of uh, Taylor Valley. It's an outcrop of basement rocks, some of the oldest rocks exposed here in the Transnordic Mountains. It's a beautiful spot because you can look down the glacier towards McMurdo Sound. You can look up the valley towards Upper Taylor Glacier. And the valley we're standing on used to be covered by a thick, thick um, packet of glacial ice. Pretty cool. Come on. in the distance. Those dark banded rocks and light rocks back there are part of the Beacon Supergroup. These are sedimentary rocks that were laid down across this area of the trans Mountains and they were fundamental in helping us figure out something about Earth history. Back in the 1970s, 1960s when geologists were working here, they were very surprised to see these rocks here because they're in exactly the same sequence, going from sandstones, into glacial sediments and then coal bearing beds with plant fossils in this sequence. That's the same sequence of rocks that occurs in South Africa, in India, in Australia. And by finding the same rock sequence in all of those continents, it means they had to be close to each other at some time in the past. That was a revelation in Earth history. You have to move India and Australia and South Africa all back down towards Antarctica, piece them together like a puzzle to be able to make all these rocks match up. After these flat-lying sediments were transformed into mountains, glaciers moved in and shaped the landscape that we see today. This is a very changing landscape, changing with climate change. The small glaciers that you see coming down off the sides here were bigger, and they were flowing into this very large Taylor Glacier coming down this valley. The Earth is really a dynamic planet. Now, it's very difficult to study geology in Antarctica mostly because it is such a challenge to get here, and even when you get here, it's very hard to find the rocks that aren't covered in ice. And even when you find these rocks, you need special helicopters or airplanes to get you there. Your field season is extremely limited. You only have a few short months during the summer to do your field work. Now, another challenge that Antarctic geologists face is tracking the sediments that have been moved by massive glaciers across the continent. Sediments will erode from the tops of mountains and settle in deep basins, and these basins will fill with water, and since it is such a cold place, ice will form and settle on the top of this water. So Antarctic geologists have to be very clever in the way that they choose to get to the rocks. What we do know about Antarctica's geological history is based on rock outcrops that we can see that aren't covered by ice. We also have information from other drilling projects, that reveal older, deeper layers of the story. And we also have a fossil record of the different kinds of plants and animals that have lived during this time. So now what I would like to do is pretend that we're getting into a geological time machine, and we're gonna go back in time to see how the environment has changed. Well, geologists believe that uh, the Phanerozoic, uh, which comprises the last 540 million years of Earth history, um, can be divided into periods of relatively warm climate, which they call greenhouse eras and periods of relatively cold climate which they call ice house eras and um, we're, we're living in an ice house era now it's been it's been going on for about uh, 42 million years um, the last time that a similar ice house regime existed was back in the late Paleozoic 300 million years or so ago now at this time Antarctica was part of a large supercontinent called Gondwana and this was made up of the land masses that we know today 
as Africa, Madagascar, Australia, New Zealand, India, South America, and Antarctica. And during this time, this large landmass was covered by ice sheets. This may have been the most intense ice age of the last 500 million years. Now it was a different sort of style of glaciation than we have today. Rather than being covered by immense ice sheets, the evidence we have from the geological record suggests that there were multiple smaller ice sheets covering different parts of Antarctica. If we move forward in time to about 250 million years ago, we know that there were little plants growing in Antarctica called Glossopteris, and these plants had to thrive in a much warmer climate condition, and they usually grew in swampy areas, and over time these swamps became coal deposits, and we can see these coal deposits in the Transantarctic Mountains today. Now if we go back into the Jurassic period, about 200 million years ago, again there's evidence of the earth being much warmer. Different trees like ginkgos and cycads were growing, and volcanoes were prevalent across the continent. This was also the age of dinosaurs, and one reptile known as the Lystrosaurus was roaming around, and two Antarctic species of dinosaurs have been identified, and they're known as the Cryolophosaurus and the Antarctopelta. The sea life was also very active with ammonites, Ammonites are related to the squid, nautilus, and octopus that we find in our oceans today. Now about 70 million years ago, we have evidence that plants and animals still thrived in the warmer conditions, and most of our information is based on the fossil record. So that is a tree, and you can see the tree rings that the tree puts out each year for an annual growth pattern. And you can see these, um, these sort of big ginkgo leaves and we have these big fern deposits here and so the whole picture of all of these is something of a lush vegetated setting where you have big forests, big uh, lakes, lots of wet lush environment. It wasn't until fairly recently, about 40 million years ago, that the Transantarctic Mountains, a distinct feature across the continent, began to form. We also have evidence that conifer forests dominated the landscape and many geologists have compared Antarctica at this time to what we might find in southern Chile today. Now when you come to Antarctica today, you don't see any of these conifer forests. In fact, you don't see any trees at all just because they cannot survive here. So something happened in the last 40 million years. The principal mission of, of the Evangel's uh, drilling programs is, is to um, acquire a much more closely resolved, a much more detailed record of environmental change through the last 42 million years, through the time frame of the Cenozoic Ice House. And uh, thus far, up to, up to now, we have a, only really a partial record. We have, we have fragments of the record and we're seeking to fill in the gaps. And this is, a, this is a really exciting time because as yet there is no complete understanding of this period of time. And so we, we really are at, at the forefront of, of understanding the, uh, the nature and, and, and time frames of, of environmental change through the last 42 million years. 